These are things that, that really will impact you long-term. How many people in this world spend the last 10 years of their life in and out of doctor's office, in and out of pharmacies, picking up medications, in and out of hospitalizations. Maybe they're in a home that requires somebody to care for them cook for them, feed them, do whatever it is. After the age of 65, if you fall and break a hip, your risk of death in the next year is like 30 to 40%. I mean, your time and energy is your most valuable asset. Once you can figure out how to get your brain in that place, you are unstoppable. So each day you either get better or you get worse. This video is a conversation I had with Dr. Jamie Seaman, also known as Dr. Fit and Fabulous. She's an OBGYN in Nebraska. And in this video, we talk about the five pillars on how to become hard to kill. Honestly, I thought she nailed it. It was perfect. And I couldn't agree more with what she said. So here's Dr. Fit and Fabulous. So I'm born and raised in Nebraska. I still live here. I say if it's not broke, don't fix it. But um, I, I grew up as an athlete and I got to play collegiate softball for the Huskers. But because I was so athletic and I was a three-sport athlete, I really got away with eating a not great diet. No offense to my parents. I grew up in the 80s and the 90s and convenience food was where it was at. We ate hamburger helper, I think sometimes without the hamburger. And rice aroni. I mean, I can just, it's crazy now to think, you know, the things I ate growing up. But I got to college and I was pursuing a degree in nutrition exercise and health science with a with a pre-med track. I wanted to be a doctor. And that was my first exposure to nutrition and how to eat as an athlete. Um, but it was kind of a strange time in my life because, you know, you're coming into college. I had just started dating my my now husband. And I was lifting a lot of weights. Like I didn't want to be like big and bulky. So like from a fitness perspective, like I didn't, I didn't want big quads and big biceps. And then from a nutrition perspective, I was a college kid. So, you know, let's be real. Although I was eating, you know, trying to eat healthy at the training table. I mean, I was drinking beer and eating Taco Bell. <laughs> and so then when my husband and I got married after college, we went to, I uh, went to medical school and this was the first time in my life where I really started struggling with my weight because I suddenly was sedentary. So I went from being a collegiate athlete to sitting in the library for long hours of the day and tests every Saturday. And I had gained weight. And so from being a nutrition major, I thought, well, I just have to control my calories. So I started tracking my calories. I was literally counting goldfish crackers. And, and it worked okay. I mean, I was still working out too, but then in medical school, we decided to have, start a family. So I got pregnant with my first daughter. I had a lot of struggle getting pregnant. My doctor thought I had PCOS. I was on metformin. She wrote me a prescription for Clomid. But thankfully after nine to 10 months, we were able to get pregnant with our daughter and I failed my glucose testing in pregnancy. And I was diagnosed with hypothyroidism after she was born. And I would go on to have two more children during my training and each time failing my glucose testing. And, and I mean, I wasn't eating horrible, but let's be real. <laughs> Doctors sometimes aren't the best patients. And after my third daughter was born, I went through just a major tragedy in my life. I talk about it in my book. I lost one of my best friends and it was kind of this pivotal moment in my life where I realized here I am, I've got a nutrition degree. I've got a medical degree. I was recently diagnosed with prediabetes after I had my three girls, but from the outside, I was, I didn't look unhealthy. I was not obese by anybody's standards. I even had a decent amount of muscle mass still left. And you just, I realized that you can't, you, you actually don't know how unhealthy people are right from the outside, like just looking. And so I set out on a personal journey to fix my own health first, because I felt like as a physician, like I didn't want to just tell people what to do all day. I wanted to be like a living, breathing example of walking that walk. So in 2015, 2016, um, I started to really clean up my diet and I started with doing whole 30 is actually how I started with a couple of friends. And of course, you know, I felt pretty good just eliminating all the junk food. Then I realized how much I liked cheese because I, I had tried paleo. So I finally settled on keto in 2016, 2017, and it was amazing. It was like the lights turned on in my brain again, the weight came off, my thyroid improved. I just started to feel so much better. But at this time, 
like being a physician and promoting the ketogenic diet was like kind of the black sheep. I guess we still are to this day a little bit, but I just started diving into the research. Like what, like, and I realized like, we really have this so wrong in medicine. So I decided to go back to fellowship. So I went back and completed an integrative medicine fellowship at the University of Arizona because I really felt like there had to be other tools, you know, that I could help my patients with. And so I completed my fellowship, became one of the first doctors in the United States to be a board certified ketogenic nutrition specialist. And it completely shifted the way that I practice medicine. Um, to this day, everything is very prevention forward. And I wrote a new book this year that basically talks about what I consider to be these five pillars of health that I think people have to do those things first before you turn to medicine for, for, for other options. I mean, it's like the basic foundations and, um, I've never looked back. It's, I, I'm a different mom. I'm a different doctor, a different wife. Uh, it's, it's amazing when you really take care of your body. Um, you know, it changes the way you feel and function on a daily basis. Absolutely. I'm wondering as an OBGYN, if you're going to be able to say something similar to what other, I mean, I've spoken with optometrists, dermatologists, cardiologists, dentists, and it seems like each person, whatever field they specialize in, is able to tell the health of the individual based on that one particular body part. So for example, we were just talking about Dr. Kevin Stock. He had said that as a dentist, your mouth is a mirror into the rest of your body. So if your teeth are rotting, if your gums are bleeding, if you have stinky breath, if you have a lot of cavities, it's really hard for you to have a not healthy mouth, but the rest of your body to be in perfect health condition. So can you say something similar about being an OBGYN? Yeah, I mean, pregnancy, I always tell people, you know, things that pop up in pregnancy are kind of a window into your future. For instance, we know that people that develop gestational diabetes are the mom themselves is not only at a lifetime increased risk of developing diabetes, obesity, and heart disease, but her baby is as well. Mm -hmm. And so this is a really big deal. Um, Preeclampsia that develops, you know, it's hypertension of pregnancy, increased lifetime risk of cardiovascular disease and chronic hypertension. So the physiologic stress that occurs during a pregnancy definitely is a window into your metabolic health and what your long-term risks are. Yeah. Well, I know that even when I was eating a standard American diet as a teenager, no one had really taught me about how I was skipping a cycle. I was having UTIs. I was getting medications, going to the doctors when I was a teenager because I didn't realize there was a correlation with what I ate and how that impacted my oatmeal each part of my health, not just like one part of how I look. And I, you know, like you were saying, I was also a track and field athlete for college um, and I looked very healthy. Meanwhile, I was eating whatever I wanted and still skipping a cycle and just like having difficult difficulties with that area. So yeah, and it's not just food, you know, it's, there's so many, that's why, that's why there's five pillars. Um, but nutrition, I think is the one that's super important because it's something we do every day, multiple times per day. So with the five pillars, what, what are all five? Yeah. Okay. So the first pillar is nutrition. So nutrition, like I said, you do it every day, you do it multiple times per day. When we think about nutrition, obviously nutrition is energy, right? It's calories that we consume. And, you know, of course there's a lot of debate out there. Does, do calories matter? Yeah. In the grand scheme of things, calories do matter. You need to be taking in enough energy to, you know, supply your body. Now, the problem with the human body is that as a mechanism of survival, we actually have an unlimited capacity of storage of energy. So we can store about 2000 calories of energy in our body as, as glucose, as glycogen, mostly in the liver and in the muscles. And then the rest of that is stored as fat. So everybody listening right now, of course, you can, you know, pinch on places of your body. That's your subcutaneous fat and that's stored energy. So when we think about what calories we're really eating, you know, we're eating basically these three macronutrients, protein, fat, and carbohydrates. And protein and fat are the only two macronutrients that are basically a requisite for life. We have to consume amino acids and these essential fatty acids to stay alive. Carbohydrates are what we would consider non-essential for human life because we can actually make enough glucose 
from substrates from protein and fat. But does that mean that eating zero carbohydrates is the answer? Probably not for everybody. So then when it comes to those three macronutrients, you know, then we say, well, how much do you eat of, of each of these things? And I'm very protein forward. So protein is basically the, the, the base of the house, the foundation of it, because it's, it's really not an energy calorie. It's, it's more, I think of it as like Lego, like little building blocks. For instance, if you're thinking about a pregnant woman, right, you need enough little Lego pieces to build the, you know, Lego picture on the front of the box. You don't, you can't have missing parts. And so proteins provide us amino acids, some are essential, some are non-essential, but when it comes to protein, the reason that protein is so important from a nutritional aspect is the next pillar we're going to talk about is exercise is lean body mass or muscle is, is an organ that is going to make you hard to kill if you have a lot of muscle. And to do that, we need enough protein in general, but we also need enough leucine. So leucine is the major amino acid that drives muscle protein synthesis. So when it comes to how much protein to eat, most women are severely deficient in protein. Mm -hmm. um, if you're eating at the recommended daily allowance, which is 0.8 grams per kilogram, that's basically enough to prevent deficiency, like to prevent chronic disease, but that's not optimal for function. That's not optimal for me being able to sprint up a flight of stairs and save a woman's life or you being able to outrun a bear or, I mean, whatever thing we would have to do, you know, in our lives. So protein, I'm a huge fan of eating a lot more of that. Now, when it comes to low carbon ketogenic diets, eating too much protein can kick you out of ketosis. So it's always consuming things in context of your goals. But the other two calories are essentially fat and carbohydrates. And in this situation, I always say you kind of have to pick which horse to ride. You can't overconsume fat and carbohydrates. That's basically the standard American diet, deficient in protein, high in fat and carbs, and it leads to metabolic disease. Now, I kind of already touched on carbs a little bit. I think with carbohydrates, you go low and you, go, you titrate up based on your tolerance. So for me, I had prediabetes. I had to go really low, less than 30 grams of carbs per day. I now have found that, and although I eat mostly a, a very meat-based carnivore diet, I can tolerate upwards of 100 carbs per day. And I still feel and function really good if it's a super physically active day, you know? And I'm not talking... Uh, rice cakes and cereal, you know, I'm talking squash, sweet potatoes and berries. I think it would be hard to get above that level of carbohydrates without eating processed junk. Mm -hmm. And really the obligatory use of carbohydrates per meal is about 40 grams. And so when you think of that, I really am not sure that there's a lot of humans that should be eating over 120 total per day, which by all, by all measurements is a, is a low carb diet. <laughs> yeah. um, and then there's fat. So most Americans are consuming very low quality fats. We're consuming a lot of omega-6 oils and processed foods, because if you turn over anything with a box or a bag at the grocery store, it's gonna have soybean oil, canola oil, which, which is, you know, PUFAs, I think sometimes everything loves to be burned at the stake <laughs> these days. Um, the problem is, is that we're consuming a lot of those and we're not consuming a lot of omega-3 fatty acids in the diet. And when I check omega-3 to six ratios in my clinic, this year in 2022, I have not found one patient that has been normal, not one. And so people are really deficient in these omega-3 fats. So we need to increase fatty fish and beef and eggs and things like this in the diet. So um, consuming less low quality fats, more high quality fats, which are going to come from animal foods, right? So red meat gets a bad rap, but basically my nutrition structure for people is eat whole foods. So I don't care if you're vegan or carnivore, anywhere in between, you can read my book and probably agree on some things. Eat real whole foods, get rid of processed foods, eat more protein than you probably think you should. I think a gram per pound body weight more if you're sedentary, older, or have metabolic disease. So grandma needs more protein than the grandkids do at the Thanksgiving table. And then basically figure out your carb, your carb and fat consumption. I function best on a mostly low carb, high, high meat diet. Um, and that's been something trial and error since 2016 until 2022. And I think it forces people to eat more protein. I think I call it like low carb for dummies. Cause when you really prioritize meat then you're definitely getting more protein. Mm -hmm. And so that's basically that's nutrition in a nutshell. So uh then 
yeah, any questions about that before we move to the next pillar? Yeah. Um, so with people prioritizing protein, and I do that too, I eat probably way more than I, well, I've talked to Dr. Gabrielle Lyon too, and she's like, no, you're fine. But I, I'm about, I'm only five foot two. So I'm, I'm just as tall as her and um, I'm 110, 15 pounds. And I eat about 160 to 180 grams of protein some days. But I eat a ton of fat too, so I'm eating a lot of calories. But I know other people who sometimes listen to this, they're like, okay, I'm gonna prioritize protein. And protein is so satiating, it keeps, keeps people very full that they tend to undereat. And I, I talk about that a lot too, about how, um, you know, people will say, well, if I'm not hungry, if I'm eating 1200 calories and I'm just not hungry, then how come I have to like force feed myself to eat more? I don't suggest force feeding. I just, you know, gradually yeah. increase the calories. But that, that's a question I get a lot is like, well, if I'm not hungry for more, then why do I have to eat more? Yeah. Well, so when you go on a really calorie restricted diet, so let's say you're eating, let's drop even lower. You're, you're so satiated. You're eating one meal a day and it's 900 calories. If you do that for a long period of time, you're going to start to see changes in thyroid function. You're going to start to see changes in basal metabolic rate. But the studies actually show and people on, and they tend to rebound people that go on these really low calorie diets, but they tend to rebound because of loss of muscle. Mm -hmm. So as long as you're meeting the minimum protein requirements, you can probably get away with that type of behavior longer than somebody who's eating 900 calories a day of like slim fast bars. So I always give people a range for protein. There's a lower end and an upper end. And I'm like, you have to hit the lower end. Like you have to hit this lower end. It's so important because if you lose weight, we don't want you losing muscle. We only want you reducing body fat. And so, but that, that is something that people have to be aware of is protein and fat are very satiating and it's hard to eat a giant meal. I get really concerned at these people doing one meal a day, you know, like that are carnivore or whatever. I mean, I'm sorry. I, I would have difficulty sitting down and eating one and a half pounds of meat, like at one time. So if your goal is health and longevity and body composition, it would be more advantageous to spread that out into two to three meals, even if it was in a smaller window. Mm -hmm. I mean, intermittent fasting is a tool and I think it can be overdone. So, you know, for, for me, I think spreading it out across the day is, is more advantageous. And if you're eating healthy then great, you know, if you're eating donuts, it's hard to do that uh, because you're just constantly thinking about food and your blood sugars are all over the place. And so then eating in a smaller window is more advantageous because you're like, okay, it's donut hour and then donut hour shuts off at eight o'clock. But when you're eating these nutrient dense foods, I think, I think you naturally like feel so much better. Right. Well, I, I, I think the intermittent fasting, I got on that train too. I was like, Oh, this is great. I'm going to do this all the time. But it got to the point where I just couldn't get enough food in and I had yeah, to split it up. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, that's the thing I always tell people it's a tool. It's just like exercise. It can be overdone. Like you can overdo anything. So, you know, if it works and you're getting adequate nutrition, fabulous. Because like for somebody like me, like I always give this example, I'm a surgeon. So sometimes I get called into the operating room at seven o'clock in the morning. You know, I don't get out till lunchtime. Then I'm in clinic Then I'm seeing patients Then I'm home. I mean, I live a, lead a very big, like I don't have time to eat six times a day. <laughs> so I love the idea that I can eat, you know, two meals or whatever, but you can't, you can't live that type of schedule and only eat one meal a day for a long period of time. You have to make sure that, you know, over time, over days and weeks amount of time that you're getting an average level of, of nutrition that's required to, to fuel and fuel you and make you function. Yeah, absolutely. So with movement then for somebody, does it matter how old somebody is, how much movement they should be getting in a day? And it doesn't matter if they're lifting weights or if it's just walking or if it's tennis or what all goes into movement. Yeah. So the second pillar is movement. And the, the pillar two about movement is really about creating a, a body composition that's going to help you live a long time. Because after the age of 65, if you fall and break a hip, your risk of death in the next year is like 30 to 40%. So as we age, we develop something called age-related sarcopenia. And so with movement, you know, all movement is great. There's very good evidence that 10,000 steps a day has evidence behind it. 150 minutes of aerobic exercise a week, definitely these things contribute to, to health span. When it comes to movement, when we think about movement that helps us 
create lean body mass and keep lean body mass, it requires resistance training. Our bodies were physically designed to be stressed, to do hard things, to run and jump and pull and push. And so unfortunately for women, that requires resistance training. And I think three to four times a week is probably most ideal, minimum two, but three to four times a week would probably be most ideal. And then on those other days, just doing things that, you know, if you like playing tennis, I'm not a huge fan of just getting on a cardio machine for 30, 60 minutes. You can definitely overdo cardio and you can definitely overdo cardio and push cortisol high and it can hurt your, your lean body mass. So, um, the, the more time efficient way is high intensity interval training. And most people who think they're doing hit are not actually doing real hit. <laughs> Real high intensity interval training only has to be done for actually a couple of minutes with each workout. So if you're going to be in the gym for an hour, we're talking like two to three minutes of bike sprints, treadmill sprints. We're talking like all out capacity and it doesn't matter how old you are. If you can only go five miles an hour and that's a sprint for you, cool, push it to that capacity. And then over time, you're actually going to see it improve. But these are things that are going to increase our lean body mass reduce our subcutaneous body fat and reduce our visceral fat, mm -hmm. which is the fat that's around our organs, which is in my opinion, one of the most dangerous biometrics. If you want to, if you want to check just one biometric and predict somebody's risk of mortality. Mm -hmm. And so when it comes to movement, move your body, be physically active, lift heavy things, consider high intensity for just short periods of time and you're, you will be far better off as you age. When we think about our years, I always like to give this visual when I do talks, basically lifespan is like the day you die or the day you're born until the day you die. Only thing we're guaranteed in life is death. Like when I deliver babies, only thing they're guaranteed is they're going to die <laughs> at some point. Health span is, is the time in which we're able to do all the things we want to do. So I always say, think about what you want your last 10 years to look like, or think about your grandparents, right? How many people in this world spend the last 10 years of their life in and out of doctor's office, in and out of pharmacies, picking up medications, in and out of hospitalizations, maybe they're in a home that requires somebody to care for them and cook for them, feed them, do whatever it is. I think most people would say that they would love to be independent. They'd like to live in their own house. They'd like to vacation. They'd like to do things that bring them joy. So if you want to do those things, you have to take care of your physical form to be able to do that for a long time. I know that even as just a, a younger person in this space that people will sometimes think like, you don't, you have so much more time, Lily, you don't have to be like getting this healthy right now. And I think about a lot of people my age too, who already have PCOS, depression, they're on medications, they are gaining weight. And I just think about, you know, yes, donuts are great, but being able to not, you know, like you said, be in and out of the hospital, have, you know, be on medications. I want to be able to be independent and live my life the whole time. Um, you know, I think even if somebody like we were saying looks healthy on the outside, if they're still feeding themselves and they're not sleeping and they're not getting the exercise, um, you know, I would like to have that life. Like you said, an abundant life, a free life that we can't be as free if we're not honoring our bodies today. Yeah. It's pretty amazing. As you get older, my husband and I are coming into our forties and it's amazing with each decade of your life to look around at your peers and your cohort or people you went to high school with, and you can start to see who is aging at an accelerated level and who is not. Yeah. And so even though people might say like, oh, you're in your twenties, like, you know, live a little or whatever, like these are small things on a daily basis that add up over time. Like people don't just go from being like normal body weight to an overweight pre-diabetic in one year. Like it took me five or six years and it's always a spectrum. So each day you either get better or you get worse. I think I've heard uh, that if you take two twins and like even just something small, like five minutes of walking, one of them does five minutes of walking every single day, it compounds versus the other person who didn't move at all. Then, you know, they, this person ends up having hours and weeks of exercise in comparison that just like the small changes, we don't have to go on these dramatic diets crazy workout protocols, um, but just like the small things really compound. So um, with sleep, 
I, I always go back and forth on what do I think is the most important thing people should prioritize? Because I think if we don't get enough sleep in the next day, we're not going to make as healthy choices with our food. We're also going to have higher, we're going to be more stressed. So sleep impacts like so much, but at the same time, if I'm not eating proper foods, it's harder for me to get a good night's sleep. So I always go back and forth, which is most important, but sleep is definitely something I prioritize. Yeah. Well, proper sleep, basically good quality sleep starts during the day. Yep. And I can tell you how much sleep will mess you up because I deliver babies in the middle of the night. And if I get called in at two or three o'clock in the morning to deliver a baby, it screws up everything for me the next day. My satiety is horrible. I'm just constantly hungry. I've worn CGMs. My blood sugars are all over the place. So I can tell you from personal experience how much that messes you up. And I have a husband that used to work night shift as a police officer for many, many, many years. And there is good quality evidence that night shift workers die early. They get more cancer, more heart disease. So when it comes to sleep, I like to talk about what I call sleep hygiene. So when I said it starts during the day, it starts during the day by getting sunlight in the morning, getting sunlight in the morning sets your circadian rhythm. It tells you it's time to wake up. When you wake up in the morning, your body starts to heat up literally because of the presence of the sun. And as you heat up, you actually get this spike in cortisol, which is good. Cortisol is a good hormone. Okay. 30 to 60 minutes after you wake up, cortisol spikes. Then over the course of the day, cortisol starts to come down. You continue to get sunlight because the rays, the, the, the wavelengths of light change in the sun as it starts high in the sky and then it comes low at night, right? Because you see it, you see the color of the sun change, right? With these beautiful sunsets. So in the evening, you're getting more of these like orange red rays. So then at night, a couple hours prior to going to bed, you want to eliminate blue light because blue light can start to destroy your melatonin production from your pituitary gland. And of course, we all have like phones and computers and all these things. And we're sitting and working on them late at night, or we're literally sitting in bed, you know, scrolling Instagram or whatever it is. And that's just horrible for our sleep. You can wear blue light blocking glasses, but they actually have to be pretty legitimate ones, like orange or red lenses to block a higher uh, proportion of that. But even just turning lights down in your house, um, mm -hmm. you can just switch out light bulbs, uh, you know, get rid of the, uh, uh, those really bright light bulbs, you know, sit by candlelight. These things are all good for your mood and your parasympathetic system too. Removing caffeine and alcohol. So caffeine's great, but there are certain people that genetically don't metabolize it very fast. And you could have a morning caffeine dose with like your pre-workout and it might still be hanging around when it's bedtime at night. So just something to be aware of. Alcohol is horrible for sleep, just across the board, especially within a couple hours of sleep. Um, it, it's really bad for your brain. It's really bad for your body. The, the bedroom, the bedroom environment really matters. So when you go to sleep at night, you actually want to be cold. You want your bedroom to be 70 degrees or less, really in all honesty. And I know people living in like hot climates are like, dude, the AC bill would be crazy. <laughs> we keep it at 62. But but you want the bedroom to be cold. So if you can't get your air temperature down, you know, you could think of something like a chili pad, which is like these cold water things you can put on your bed. You can just sleep naked or sleep with like light clothing, light bedding, these new memory foam mattresses. A lot of times are too hot. People are too hot. They can't even get good, good quality sleep. So you want to just kind of look at your bedroom and, and that environment. You want it to be dark. You don't want any TVs in there. You don't want smartphones next to your bed. Um, ideally no pets or kids, but I'm the mom of three who ends up with a kid in her bed sometimes, but these are all things that contribute to, to your sleep. And it's really important. Your sleep is so important. Um, you can accrue sleep debt. Like when you go through your twenties and thirties and you're just like abusing sleep, it's really hard to make that up. I mean, when you're talking days upon weeks and years of sleep debt, that's hard to, that's hard to make that up. And so every single night you want to focus on that good quality sleep. There are other things you can try. Um, sleeping medicines don't work. They're just like a hammer over the head. Um, things like CBD, kava, theanine, valerian root. Um, you can do mouth taping. Airway is so important um, to make sure that you don't have something like obstructive sleep apnea, a huge, widely, widely, widely undiagnosed condition in a lot of people. So get your airway assessed, especially if your partner says you snore um, at night, but sleep is so important for our health. And that's actually when a lot of our hormones are made and it's when our body's repairing and regenerating. So you could be eating this great diet and doing these killer workouts. And if you're not sleeping properly, it's, it's going to hurt, hurt your results. Everything you said, I couldn't agree with more. I feel like I was going down my checklist 
she said cold room, dark room, morning exposure to daylight, just going down the list. I was like, perfect. Um, with your fourth pillar mindset, what does that really mean? Because some people mindset would be that you have to be meditating other people. That might mean you have to get your chakras aligned. So what exactly is the mindset piece? Yeah. Yeah. This, this chapter is um, about mindset, but it's really about resiliency. It's about, you know, stress, mental, physical, emotional, spiritual stress that we encounter and how do we become more resilient in all of those things. And obviously our, our brain, our mentality, this, like I, I, I talk a lot in the book about how it's, it's hard to kill is more of a mentality than anything. It's not just like this plan, like don't just like execute the plan, but it's just this mentality of, of resiliency because stress is good. I mean, stress is actually where friction is where we see growth in our life and, and, and stress is a good thing, but we have to figure out how to use it to our advantage and then, and then get past it. Right. And so I talk in this, in this chapter about, about mindset, because the language that we use in our brain basically drives our action. And so when you wake up in the morning, your internal language basically is driving all of your behaviors. And if you continue to believe that you are sick and fat and tired because you were abused as a child, that is a self-perpetuating story. And we, these are things that just happen in the background of our brain that we don't even realize we're having. We have thousands upon thousands upon thousands of thoughts per day. And so when you can figure out, that's like, that's the magic sauce. When you can figure out how to literally kind of select those thoughts and pick those thoughts and cultivate this. I mean, it's something that takes a lot of practice and a lot of practice and a lot of practice. And there's lots of different ways to, to do it and achieve it. But that's like, that's the game changer right there. And then when it comes to physical, you know, stress and resilience, like I said earlier, like you can train, but you can also overtrain. Um, but there's other ways that we can provide um, stressors to our body that will make us more physically resilient. So these are things like cold therapy, sauna therapy, red light therapy. There's these other ways that we can hormetically stress the body to create more resiliency on a physical level. And it's basically kind of like, really acknowledging that recovery is important. You know, um, we have to balance those two things constantly. And then, you know, spiritual resilience is a lot about, you know, some people might think of this in a religious context, you know, having something that's bigger than you. And it's really about your network and your tribe and really kind of figuring out your purpose in life. And I think of spiritual as kind of like the ripples that you leave in the world. And that was a lot of the purpose for me writing this book was, you know, as a physician, I can only see so many people in a day, I can only touch so many people, but, you know, with this kind of information um, and really empowering people to do it for themselves, I think I can make a much larger impact. And, and that's, um, that's really cool to see that play out. Definitely. I can only imagine when people retire, if they don't have hobbies or something they'd love to do or grandkids without having that something that gets us wanting to wake up, get out of bed, get dressed, tackle the day without that sense of purpose, it can just be harder for people to want to keep going as long. Um, but I have to ask now, do you have a favorite book? Because when we talk about mindset, I just think of so many good books. Yeah, I got, I mean, I've read a ton of different books and I've got a bunch on my bookshelf at home. One that really resonated with me when I was kind of going through my own struggles, um, Mel Robbins wrote a book called The Five Second Rule. And I think it's a, I think it's an amazing book because I think it gives you something tangible that, that you can use in your real everyday life. And, um, if you haven't ever seen Mel Robbins work for anybody listening, like she's got a YouTube and a, you know, all the social channels, and she's got this book called the five second rule. And, um, it's super powerful. It's super powerful. Basically the reason I think it's so important is we live in a really big mental health crisis right now, like anxiety, depression, and basically people who experience anxiety, that's an untrained mind. That's what that is. And what fixes anxiety is action. And so this, this five second rule, um, and, and she describes how to use it really well in her book, but 
basically as soon as as soon as you know something needs to be done or a decision has to be made or whatever it is you basically have five seconds to act on it so it really prevents people from like overthinking because i think we try to think our way out (laughs) of a lot of things in our daily life and it creates decision fatigue and basically as you as you delay something, as you procrastinate something, and I'm totally that person. Like if it's not due till Monday, it's not getting done till Sunday night. <laughs> but that's a form of stress relief. That's a way that we provide ourselves dopamine by saying like, oh, it's okay. I'll do it on Sunday night. I'll do it on Sunday night. But this book was really pivotal for me in just like thrusting me into like action. And it's, she talks a lot about morning routine, about like, as soon as the alarm hits in the morning, like feet on the floor within five seconds, like it's, it's, it's really applicable to every area of your life, but it, I'm telling you, I'm telling people listening right now that like, once you can figure out how to get your brain in that place, you are unstoppable. That sounds great. When I was in high school, I played volleyball and we also had what was called the five second rule where if you missed a point or you had a bad play, you only had five seconds to switch your attitude and be ready to take action before the next serve was coming your way. So I definitely have to check that book out. I haven't read it yet. And then with your last pillar, your fifth pillar, it's about environment. That could mean so many things. So what exactly do you mean by taking care of your environment? Yeah, it's kind of a catch-all chapter, but basically what environment encompasses is like the people, places, and things that we interact with. So (laughs) from a people perspective, you can have toxic people in your life. So this is about auditing your circle, figuring out who the people are that you hang out with the most, because you will literally start to do what they do. Mm -hmm. And um, so I had a mentor one time that was like, if you want to own a yacht, go down to the yacht club and just like do what those people do. But I give the example, like if you want to be super fit and jacked like go hang out with super strong people eat what they eat train how they train and you I mean you will become that Mm -hmm. and so places the places that we live our air quality our soil quality literally the materials that our home is made out of the places that you live have an impact on your health and so this just really acknowledges that um, these are things we don't think about when it comes to our health but like we live in a place in Nebraska where there's like tons of lead in the soil And so these are just things you have to think about if you're struggling with some sort of health concern that it could be something environmentally that you need to need to figure out. And then things, this is a huge one. And this is actually why I included this chapter in the book as a mom of three daughters, the makeup that we use, the lotions, the soaps, the detergents, the plastic food containers, the plastic water bottles. There's so many of these things in our life. And it's great that we live in a world where we can like Amazon prime things, but unfortunately in industrialized nations there's a there's a payoff for everything there's a payoff there was a payoff for agriculture that's what drove a lot of the sugar and carb consumption in the modern human diet but basically just kind of it you'll you'll feel overwhelmed when you first read this chapter because literally everything we interact with is so toxic in our world but just even if you can just a few things a week a few things a month kind of switch it out for better products get rid of your plastic containers, switch to glass, switch to stainless steel water bottles, all of these things can still make make a major impact on your health. I know when people hear about chemicals, they'll say there's chemicals in everything and you can't avoid it. And sure, but you can minimize it. And I think, like you said, we didn't just buy a brand new home overnight. We slowly started buying the 100% organic cotton sheets. So we're not sleeping in the plastics, started buying new laundry detergent, new soaps and just slowly made a new change maybe every month um, and we're still continuing to do that. And then the other thing with environment that I really liked is when you said about who you surround yourself with impacts your overall well-being. I know that sometimes if you're getting the phone call from someone who usually tends to be the negative Nancy, you can even start feeling that stress already before you answer the phone. So either maybe you're spending less time talking to that person or you just know when you go into that conversation, maybe you can start reframing the conversation so that way it doesn't go down that rabbit hole. Yeah, Yeah. I mean, you have to quit giving attention to, and your energy, I mean, your time and energy is your most valuable asset, most valuable asset. And unfortunately, when I set out on kind of living, you know, this, this new way of life, 
like you will quickly realize that there are people in your life that are not willing to accompany you on that journey. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. There are plenty of people in this world that are willing to meet you at your level of interest and commitment. Mm -hmm. And so this chapter just really acknowledges that there may be people near and dear to you that you're going to have to physically distance yourself from your time, your energy doesn't mean, I mean, maybe it's your mom or whatever, right? Like these are people that be pretty hard to just say like, okay, we're done. Although you have a very interesting story, Lily, but, um, but these are things that, that really will impact you long-term. You know, if you stick around and continue to pour your time and energy into, into people that, that are not, that are not giving it back, like, that's, that's on you. Like that was your decision. And so, um, it's just a really important thing that you have to do is I call it audit your circle in the book, audit your circle. Like if you're living, if you're in a work environment, that's horrible, leave, go do something else. If you're in a relationship, that's like that, you might have to leave, but your time and energy, like you might be dead tomorrow. It's not, it's not worth it. Um, if it's not serving you and your purpose.